damnation sermons? Now, I don't know how Brother Philpot preached, but um, it's been a long time since I have heard a good old-fashioned held up fire and damnation sermon, you know. And maybe that's a good thing. If I was to preach a hellfire and damnation sermon, I want to do it in the middle of August and be sure the air conditioning isn't on. I um, am out of uh, literature as my academic background, and I love teaching that old Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards' sermons. And he has a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Have you heard of that one before? And uh, the historians say that, that um, Brother Edwards wrote out his sermon and read them. Now don't worry, I'm not going to read a sermon to you this morning, right? He would read it, and he would read it in a monotone voice. But his sermons were so powerful, as the story goes, that women were fainting in the, in the aisles. Now, I'm not setting that as a goal for my message today, okay? If any of you ladies feel the vapors coming on, I want you to fan yourself and, and uh, just don't be doing any fainting. It ruins everything. But his sermon would talk about sinners as being like a spider, dangling by that spider's thread over the flames of hell. And all that was holding that spider up from the flames of hell was God. And at any moment, the sinner could fall into the fire. And he used another image that sin is like being weighted down with heavy weights and being tossed into the ocean and sinking, trying to stay afloat and those sins pulling you down to the bottom of the ocean. Well, you can see why the ladies fainted, right? <laughs> Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Then I probably err on the side of not talking about the reality of hell. But hell is a real thing. And judgment is a real thing. And without the saving grace of Jesus Christ without our affirming publicly our faith and our belief in Him, we stand in danger of the flames of hell. Now I'm going to take as my passage for my message this morning a scripture that you may or may not be familiar with. You all know John 3.16? I begin reading there and read through the 21st verse. If you would like, join me in your scripture. For God sent the Son into the world, not to... Whoop, whoop. Am I in the right spot? Yes. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but... He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light and that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. The issues of sin and salvation. Well, why do we sin? Well, the answer to that is sin looks good. Sin is always attractive to us. There's no such thing as an ugly sin. If, there, if sin was ugly, we could say no, no thanks, right? It is attractive. It is a temptation. Sin is attractive because it is a perversion of something that is genuinely good. Lust is a perversion of love. A caring and supportive attitude perverted by sin becomes possessiveness. A desire to succeed in life, to succeed in career perverted by sin can become greed and materialism. Now, sin always looks attractive to us. We are drawn toward it, but it's a lie. Adam and Eve in the garden, that apple that Eve picked, 
looked pretty. The scriptures say the apple was attractive and seemed to her to be good to eat, but it was a lie. My grandparents, uh, when I was a kid, farmed at Bangs, and Bangs is just out from Brownwood. And uh, so every summer, my brother and I would go down and we'd spend summer and a lot of weekends down on the, on the farm with my grandparents. And my grandmother had a pear tree right outside her kitchen window. And I think it, she was more proud of her pear tree than she was her grandsons, you understand. And grew these beautiful big pears, uh, made pear jam out of it. And I've had a lot of pear jam, but I've never tasted anything as good as my grandmother's. And you understand, I never will. Now, I learned, my brother and I learned that if you wanted a pear, you needed to ask grandmother first. Because if you took a pear, she knew how many pears were on there, she would be unhappy with us. But if you asked, she would say, yes, get a pear. And you'd go out and you'd pluck a pear off. Well, you know, it wasn't many times of plucking pears that I discovered something. You needed to investigate that pear. You needed to look at it carefully. And if there was a little black hole somewhere on that pear, don't pick that one. You know why? Because there'd be a worm in there. Do you know what's worse than finding a worm in your pear? Oh, you've heard the joke. Half a pear. <laughs> half a worm. Y'all aren't supposed to ruin my joke. <laughs> That's right. That pear was beautiful and attractive, but it was rotten inside. And that's how sin is for us. You know, I think for Christians, when we sin, it's in those moments that we have forgotten that God so loved us that he sent his only son to die for us. Christians sin because we don't remember. We forget in that moment and we sin. How is it that Jesus Christ, fully human, as much a human being as we are, you and I are, how is it that he lived a perfect life? How did he manage that? He didn't have any kind of special gift, any sort of magic wand that he could wave. No, he was a human being, fully human. How was he able to live his life without sin? I think it's because he never forgot. Not for one single second of his life did he forget the love of his Father God. And so every moment, in every moment, he remembered. And Jesus was tempted. The scriptures tell us he was tempted. Can you imagine, of all of the people of all of earth, who did the devil want to tip to sin the most? You think you and I are tempted? Our temptation, I think, is probably nothing like the temptation that the devil threw at Jesus Christ. Because if he could get him to sin, it would ruin God's plan. And in the midst of those temptations to sin... Christ never for a moment forgot his Father. And so I would say to you, do you think you can go 10 minutes without sinning? For 10 minutes, concentrate. Keep in your mind the fact that God so loved you, he gave you, he gave his son for you to die for you. Yeah, you can do 10 minutes. What about half an hour? Well, if you really work on it, maybe half an hour, an hour, you think you could go a day without yielding to temptation? You know, the Bible tells us that we are to be perfect as Jesus Christ is perfect. Woo, that's a hard one. How do we do that? I would say to you, it's by remembering. You know, Paul says, in every moment, pray. Pray continually. Pray constantly. The way I understand that, he is saying, don't forget. And so when the temptation comes, don't forget that God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for us. And in that love, in that mindset, in that remembering, we can turn from the temptation 
and turn from the sin. We forget that God so loved us, and in that forgetting we rebel. I've been um, in Christian higher education for almost 45 years. I've seen a lot of freshmen come off to college. You know, first time away from home. And you know what they do? Real quick, they forget what mom and dad told them. <laughs> and they fall into temptations. And it's why I, I would say to you that Christian universities are so important. Because we help freshmen remember. When they get in trouble and they forget, we call them into the office. And we remind them that God loved them. And we try to head them back in the right direction. That happens in Christian universities. Not only do we forget and fall into sin, but we persist in it. We sin and that sin leads on to more sin. I don't have to convince you that there's evil in the world, do I? We've already talked about that this morning. There's plenty of evil in this world. Only a fool would say there's not evil in the world. I mean, look around, really. And so not only have we sinned, but we persist in it. One of my favorite stories in the scriptures, the story of prodigal son. You like that one? Uh, the prodigal son um, tells dad, I want my inheritance and I want it now. And dad gives him his inheritance and he goes off to the big city, we imagine, and he loses all of his wealth and ends up slopping hogs for a farmer. Now for a good Jewish boy, there isn't a worse job in the world than taking care of hogs. And there he is. Well, I told you that I'm a, um, an old literature teacher, so I'm going to read you a poem. Now just get ready, all right? You're going to hear a poem this morning. And it's a good one by Elizabeth Bishop. It's called The Prodigal. Now sometimes mornings after drinking bouts, he hid the pints behind a two before. The sunrise glazed the barnyard mud with red. The burning puddles seemed to reassure. And then he thought he, he almost might endure his exile another year or more. But evenings the first star came to warn. The farmer whom he worked for came at dark and shut the cows and horses in the barn, safe and companionable as in the ark. The pigs stuck out their little feet and snored. Carrying a bucket along a slimy board, he felt the bat's uncertain, staggering flight, his shuddering insights beyond his control touching him. But it took him a long time, finally, to make his mind up to go home. And that's us, isn't it? We know we're in sin. We know we're at places that we should not be, and yet we persist in it. Sometimes it takes us a long time to make our mind up to go home. Well, we sure know the, the results of sin, don't we? The wages of sin is death. All kinds of death. Physical death, and we know that sin can lead to physical death. But there's also death of our souls. Death of peace. Death of joy. Death of self-respect in our sin. And ultimately the death of eternal life. But we do gain some things in sin. We gain guilt. We gain fear. We gain ultimately an eternal death. I think one of the greatest driving forces of life is that fear of isolation. A fear of being alone. And that's exactly what death brings us. It brings us loneliness. It's what sin brings us. Isolation from other human beings. Being alone. And sin produces this. Sin produces nothingness. The scripture that I just read tells us that sin is darkness. 
taking us to a dark place. Sin is the difference between a dark, small closet and going out in the early morning and walking in these woods in our hill country on a crisp fall morning as the leaves are changing. Sin is like rummaging through a dumpster behind H-E-B for a scrap of rotting food. And the grace of God is like sitting down to that Thanksgiving feast with turkey and all the dressing. Or if you're like me, sitting down to a big plate of barbecue ribs with french fries and potato salad. Y'all don't have potlucks, I guess. <laughs> you're Baptist. Yeah, we got potlucks. All right. Sin is like rummaging through a dumpster or going through the line at a potluck dinner where you got to have two plates even to get just a little bit of every dish that's there, right? Grace is a banquet. Grace is our plates filled to overflowing. Sin is darkness and nothingness and poverty. It's pain. Sin's pain. Uh, you know, phys physicists tell us there are uh, laws of the universe, laws of the way the world works. And one of those is for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. You've heard that one. You remember that one. It's that way with sin. There are things that happen because we sin. The death of self, a suffering of the soul. Sometimes when we sin, you know, the, the reaction that comes from that sin is a physical thing. The devastation of the body physically. But it can also be something that is not obvious. Sin can bring a devastation in the soul, a loss of humanness. Sin causes us to not feel things. We don't want to feel when we're caught in our sin. We don't want to have thoughts in our mind. And we are ultimately less than God made us to be. When we're caught in sin, we are not fully human because we don't want to feel our humanity. And another thing about sin, if we're honest, other people are hurt. Now, they may not even know it. But in our sin, our relationships can be damaged. In our sin, there are innocent victims. And you all can think of examples of that. Innocent victims, children damaged by someone's sin. And why is that? I will tell you, Satan wants to injure as many people as he possibly can. Satan hates us. He hates God's creation. Now, he wants us to think he doesn't, but he does. And if Satan can cause us to sin and innocent people are hurt by that sin, so much the better as far as Satan is concerned. Our sin damages not only us, but other people. Alienation and darkness and guilt. That guilty heart. When we have guilt, we'll do anything to try to hide it, don't we? Alcoholism, drugs, immersing ourselves in television, all these kinds of things to make us not feel that guilt of our wrongdoing, our sin, that emptiness. T.S. Eliot has a poem. Don't worry, I'm not going to read this one to you. T.S. Eliot has a poem called Hollow Men. And in that poem, he talks about looking around at the people around him, and, and he says they are empty. They're hollow shells that look like human beings because of the lives that they're living. Ultimately, sin leads us to one of two things. Sin, as I have suggested, leads us to not want to be human, to not think, to not feel.
to be less than God created us to do, to be. That's one of the two things that will happen. The other thing that can happen is that our sin and, our, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives causes us to turn to God. Causes us to turn to His beckoning Spirit. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son to die that we might have eternal life and life more abundant. When you are a Christian and you are fully giving yourself to Christ, you are more human than you would have ever been in your life. Being in God means being more a full person, more empathetic with other people, more connected to the lives of those around you, loving in ways that you couldn't imagine loving without the Spirit of God in your life. You know, we serve a God that's not passive. I think about Buddhism and their image of God is Buddha sitting there in the lotus position with his fingers like this. Boy, what a God is that? That is not our God. Our God moves in lives. He moves in among us. He moves in churches. We serve a God that is engaged with humanity, engaged with his created world, engaged with the people. God seeks us. And he did from the very first. Adam and Eve sinned and they're hiding in the garden, right? Hiding in our sin. And what happened? God came walking in the cool of the day calling for them, seeking them out. Cain, their son, murders his brother Abel. And God came and sought Cain. God came and sought David after his sin of adultery and murder. God came and sought Lot in Sodom. He sought Peter in his denial of even knowing God. He sought Paul on the road to Damascus. God comes seeking us. And God comes saving us. Jesus Christ dying in agony on the cross for me. For me. Jesus Christ dying on the cross for you, for every single one of you in agony. Our guilt, our emptiness, our tendency toward being a prodigal son, our rebellion, all of our secret sins and lusts and hate. Jesus Christ died for us. But there's more than that. God sustains us too. We all know the challenges of life, the difficulties that we face, the ups and the downs. But through it all, there is the sustaining grace and love of God. A theology professor at Samford University a number of years ago, Dr. John Killinger spoke and he told this story. And for me, it is the embodiment of God sustaining us through life. He said that there was a minister, a young minister, and one of the elderly men in his church was dying. This was a century ago, I suppose. The old man was in his daughter's home, dying of illness and, and suffering greatly in that. And... The young minister went to the house to go in and visit the old fella. And as the daughter let him in, she said, how's he doing? She, he said, she said, he's not good. He just is suffering so much. I hope you can help him. And so he goes in to see the elderly gentleman and, and he, uh, he asks him how he's doing. He says, oh, pastor, it's hard. I'm hurting so bad. But worst of it is I can't pray. I try, and I just don't feel the presence of God 
in my suffering here. And that's harder than anything. Young pastor prayed with the elderly gentleman, tried to minister to him as best he could, but he left feeling like he'd failed. A week goes by, he comes back to visit him again and ask the daughter, how is he doing? And she said, you know, he's still hurting as bad as he ever hurt, but something's changed. He, he's better. So he went in to, to see the old man, and sure enough, he was better. His spirits were, were renewed. And the, the young pastor finally said, well, before you were in such a bad place, how is it that you're feeling better now? What's happened? And the old gentleman said, well, you see this chair? And there was an empty chair sitting between his bed and the wall. And he said, I just, I had him put that chair there, and I just imagined Jesus sitting in the chair beside me, and I can talk to him. They had prayer together, and the minister left, came back a few days later when the old gentleman had passed. And he came in to visit the family and minister to them, and, and he said, you know, how was his passing? And she said, it, it was in the night, and it was peaceful. But you know, the strangest thing, when we found him, he was lying with his head over in that chair. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for us and to sit in the chair beside us to sustain us and strengthen us and gift us with His love and His presence. Pray with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're here today because You loved us so much that You sent Your Son. And that You gave Your Son to die on a cross for us. And Lord, we, uh, we know too often we forget that you did that. And we sin. And sometimes it takes us a long time to admit that it's sin and to turn from it and come to you and to receive afresh and anew your grace. So Father, today, as a church, as individuals, we ask that your spirit would come. That your spirit would be powerful. And Lord, if, if we've got sin in our life, we ask that you'd bring it to our minds right now. What better place to come and confront our sin, to repent of it, than in church? Among a people who all understand sin, but all who know your grace and your love. So Father, forgive us where we fail in our sin. But Lord, Lord, we ask that not only do we accept your grace and your forgiveness, but we ex accept your spirit and your empowerment that we might be fully human and feel what you made us to be completely perfect before your eyes because of the shed blood of Jesus. And so, Father, we ask your spirit to be powerful. That you would lead us, Father, to give ourselves anew to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, church is about, uh, <coughs> about worship. And don't come to church without finding God. We've sung our hymns, and you've heard me do my best at preaching. But this is the place where worship really can happen. As we have an invitation, you search your heart. You seek where you need to find God to come in and bring light. Don't leave the sanctuary today with any darkness left. Let's stand together as we sing. You respond as the Lord leads. Number 309.